My name is Yasser, I'm a senior lecturer in pharmacy practice and a specialist antimicrobial pharmacist. I've been working for the NHS as a registered pharmacist in the UK for five years now and one of the most frequent questions that I receive on the Microfarm Instagram page is if I could provide some tips for a junior pharmacist interview. Now that's a junior pharmacist role in hospital. Today let's go through some tips to help you prepare for your junior pharmacist interview. So, one thing that I should note is the fact that I did my training year, my pre-registration year, or what we call a foundation training year, in community pharmacy. So it was a big jump to move from a training year in community pharmacy all the way to a hospital pharmacist role. And that's why I prepared a lot for the interview and I do have a lot of pointers for people that are completely new to hospital pharmacy. So let's go through them today. You may have questions with regards to the different types of roles. Um, it may be a junior pharmacist role with on-call responsibilities. It may be rotational, it may be shift working. I've made a video entirely on this. So I speak about the differences between a rotational junior pharmacist with on-call responsibilities and a junior pharmacist role that's shift working and what the differences are between the two. So make sure you watch that on the Microfarm YouTube channel. Today I'm gonna to speak about applying for these roles and the sorts of questions that you may expect to see within the interview. So within a lot of junior pharmacist interviews, you may have a competency test to determine whether or not you can do some basic processes as a hospital pharmacist. Now, if you don't work in a hospital pharmacist role, then this competency test can be extremely difficult. And I can remember when I went for the interview, I had an idea and I asked questions about what a drug chart would actually look like uh, prior to the interview. Now, if you've never seen a hospital drug chart and you're faced with this hospital drug chart, you may have no clue of what to do for the actual interview. The first thing I'll tell you to do is to look up the venous thromboembolism guideline for the hospital trust that you're applying for. So all patients will be assessed to see if they require any VTE, so venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. This is because they'll be in a hospital environment for a prolonged period of time, they will be moving a lot less, so they may require injections to prevent them from developing a blood clot. NHS trusts differ from the agent that they use for VTE prophylaxis, and that's why I would recommend being familiar with the medication that they use for VTE prophylaxis within that particular NHS trust. And having an understanding of just the basic doses that they would go for, uh, when they will alter doses with regards to the patient's renal function, so their kidney function, understanding that process is very important because sometimes when you're faced with looking at a medication chart, there may be inaccuracies with the dose for VTE prophylaxis. If you're not familiar with the doses that are normally used for VTE prophylaxis, it can really catch you out. So that's something that I would definitely say you should familiarize yourself for before your interview. The next point I would say is having an understanding of the values for that particular NHS trust. So each NHS trust holds a set of values and this differs between trusts. So the main thing I'd say is to read up on those values, have an understanding of those values, see how your values align with the hospital's values, and I will also say that you need to have an example of a time that you have demonstrated each one of those values. It's extremely common. It's almost certain that there will be a question about those NHS values. For example, one of the NHS values for a particular hospital trust may be that you're respectful. So you have to have an example of a time that you are respectful. It may be that one of the values is being trustworthy. So you have to have an example of where you've demonstrated that you are trustworthy as a trainee pharmacist or a registered pharmacist within your previous role. So always have examples of how you have demonstrated every single one of those values. Because you can't predict 
which value you're going to be questioned on. And that's why it's very important to have an example of every single one of those values. The next thing I would say is to familiarize yourself with whether or not the hospital uses electronic drug charts or physical drug charts. See if it's possible to receive a copy of an empty drug chart that could give you an understanding of how things are laid out within the drug chart where you'd expect to see VT prophylaxis, where you'd expect to see antibiotics that are prescribed, where you would expect to see stat doses, so one-off doses for medications, so that you're familiar with this if there is a competency-based assessment. Another very common question is about your ability to prioritise tasks. So this is very important. If you haven't worked in a hospital before, it's very important to demonstrate how within a community pharmacy, you have transferable skills that could be useful in your role as a hospital pharmacist. This means that you have the ability to prioritize tasks in community pharmacy. You have an understanding of what is time critical. And one of the things that people get caught up on with these questions is the fact that they're not willing to state that they have an ability to either delegate tasks, if it's appropriate, or escalate when they require help. One instance that I remember very vividly was I was on the interview panel for a hospital pharmacist role, and the person that was being interviewed was asked the question of, what would you do if you can't fit everything that you need to do in that particular day and it's of high priority. And the person that was being interviewed stated that if I can't finish the things I need to do, I will wait until the next day. But they clearly stated that the stuff that they need to do is of high priority. It, the stuff that they need to do has to be done on the day. And you could see they were clearly struggling with the fact of escalating or calling for help. And this is quite troubling for someone on the interview panel. If you've got something that's critical, like ordering a patient's medication for the epilepsy, but you haven't got enough time in the day, your fear of asking for help could mean that that patient does not receive their medication. So not being able to demonstrate when you need help or not being able to ask when you need help is quite concerning particularly for someone looking at this from a perspective where they want to hire you as a registered pharmacist. So it's all about having the ability to delegate tasks when you can and having the ability to escalate when you need help. And the simple things that you can look at is being able to prioritize tasks that are time critical to tasks that can wait. And that's having the ability to do that demonstrates your ability to prioritize tasks. Providing examples of what would be time critical and things that are not time critical can also further demonstrate your ability to understand what needs to be prioritized. Finally, let's speak about your ability to handle conflict. So a common question is the fact that you're speaking to a doctor or another medical professional and that medical professional is going to break the trust's rules and is going to do it regardless of what you say. So an example would be you notice that a doctor is taking medication for themselves and they're aware of the fact that they can't take it for themselves but they're going to do it anyway. Uh, how would you handle a situation like this? And it's really about being firm in this situation and not being disrespectful. So balancing the two. So this is a very uh, common question that comes up for a junior pharmacist role where someone may not be following the trust policy, but at the same time they use their senior authority to state that they're going to do it anyway. So it's just about handling the situation in a manner where you're respectful because this is what the hospital trust would require you to do, but being firm about the fact that it's important to follow trust policies and if you're required to do so, to use avenues to report an individual for not following those trust policies. So it's balancing the two. The last thing that you want to do with a question like this is state that due to the fact that they have a senior role, you won't do anything or due to the fact that they have a senior role you will let them make their own decisions because they know best and it's 
a fairly straightforward question if you answer it correctly. So it's just being firm with regards to what would be expected of an individual working for that NHS Trust, highlighting the importance of following guidance from the NHS Trust and being in line with policies and guidelines for that trust and being firm about the importance of upholding your moral values. I hope you found all of these tips useful. If you do have any other questions, please drop them down in the comment section below and hopefully I'll be able to answer them over the next few weeks. Good luck for your interview and I'll see you in the next one.